Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Association Leadership Radio. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Association Leadership Radio, and this is going to be a good one. Today on the show, we have Dr. Alan Pratt with the National Rural Education Association. Welcome, Alan. Hey, thanks, Lee, for having me on today. I'm excited to discuss our work and um, share our, our mission with the, with the folks that are listening. All right. Well, let's get right into it. Tell us a little bit about the NREA. How are you serving folks? Yes. Yeah, so uh, just a quick, brief history, really. We were founded in 1907, and, and we've been a, a rural education standalone association uh, since about 87. Um, so we started started in with the, the original Department of Ed back way back and then part of NEA and then broke off into our current role. Uh, we have 46 state affiliates. We have members in all 50 states. And we are really strive to be the voice of rural schools and rural communities across the country. And then so what is kind of the mission? What is the thing that gets you high fiving your peers uh, each and every day, month or quarter or school year? You know, I think telling the stories of what's what is good going on in rural communities and rural schools and, and how the work and how we're overcoming many barriers and challenges and, and really doing uh, a good job educating children and also helping prepare those students for um, roles in our community, but also roles outside of the community and uh, really the innovative uh, work that's going on and in, in, in helping our country. So how is it different for um, an educator in a rural community than an urban community or a suburban community? I think it starts with place and context. And I think if you're teaching in a rural community, a rural setting, you kind of feel more involved in that place and setting because it is smaller in most cases. And and it, it, you kind of feel a part of that community, uh, part of that family. And I think sometimes in urban areas, you're probably in an area of the city, but it doesn't mean you're necessarily a part of that area. And I think rural, you're, the school is a hub of the community and a lot of things kind of factor in far as, you know, the, the school uh, programs, extracurriculars are all really well received and taken in by the community at large. So on one side, they're uh, probably more immersed in the community, uh, maybe because there's less uh, things around them and they are kind of the community. They're more important because there's fewer. And then uh, but the challenges to that, the flip side of that coin is maybe there's less things that you would like to have. Maybe there's less teachers, maybe there's less opportunity or less, um, you know, extracurricular things that would be more available in a more maybe population dense environment yeah i think i think you you can't go into this conversation without talking about it. there are deficits in certain areas and there 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 are definitely class and course offerings that you know in the past have been really challenging because the distance from the, the school from a, a suburban or urban location but you know one thing we found going through covid is that you know, there's distance learning and different ways that we are connecting to other areas and allowing opportunities for for students. And, and we're also seeing, you know, people move to more rural areas because cost of living and also they can work remotely. So we're seeing a growth in, in a lot of those areas as well. But you're right. Some of the, the, the amenities that you would be used to having in, a, in an urban or suburban area, we don't have as many. Uh, some of the secondary amenities, you know, coffee shops and, and, you know, places to get, you know, your haircut or places just to kind of hang out. I think those are a little bit different. And uh, I think we look at it from town to town, region and region to region. But a regionalism approach is the key to this, to, to be able to lock those amenities or secondary amenities in and, and grow our communities. So now as the leader of this association, is there things that you can do um, that maybe share some some best practices that's happening around the country, maybe create some economies of scale so that everybody can benefit maybe from a technological uh, um, improvement or, or an opportunity that might be difficult for one town to really implement. But if everybody joins forces together, then it becomes affordable. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, you know, uh, 
two years ago, we started a raising rule theme of kind of raising all things up rule and making those connections instead of being a silo, being more connected. And then one of the things we've done at our conference the past two years and coming into this fall, our national conference is looking at all aspects that touch rural communities and that regionalistic approach. And, and one of the, one of those things that are, that we highlighted last year and we're going to have in October at our fall conference is a, a researcher sociologist out of Minnesota called Ben, uh, his name is Ben Winchester. And ben, Ben's really good at bringing those numbers and doing just like you talked about, how, how do we look at a regionalistic approach and what's working in certain towns that we can, you know, uh, think about, you know, noodle on, so to speak, to use slang and then carry it on to another area. And I think that's kind of what we've been doing at NREA is bringing those folks together at the table and really trying to, to work this out as we move forward. So what's your backstory? Uh, had you always been involved in this association and then worked your way up to a leadership role? Or is it something um, that just came, uh, the opportunity arose and then you stepped up? How, how did that come about? You know, I've always been in rural education as a teacher, a principal, uh, worked in the central office, worked for our state department here in Tennessee and worked with our state affiliate, Tennessee, Tennessee Rural Education Association, and really started really connecting with the national level about 2010, 2011. And uh, this opportunity came up in 2016, and I thought it was just the time to apply and see if we could uh, work it out so I could be on board. Now, is... Um since the folks that are involved in this are part of these kind of rural um, ecosystems, wherever they are spread apart, is uh, was it difficult to kind of get them to think about, okay, let's all come together on this and let's all learn together, let's all work together, let's all, you know, maybe put uh, aside some biases we might have about each other because we're in different parts of the country, but the the common good here is real and the impact is real if we can all kind of row together yeah i think when you look at it from the sense of you're right and there are regional uh, uh kind of differences of rural from northwest you know into montana and in and, and idaho as compared to the southeast or southwest or northeast uh, one of the things about nrea it's it's kind of like a family and and it's really a, a, an arm of extension of that family a place for rural educators and rural researchers feel like they belong and they're part of the group so bringing them together as a collaborative effort was not hard in the sense of bringing them to nrea uh, it is difficult when you're talking about people that are paid as social paid members and they're volunteering a lot of their time to help us out so we're appreciative of of all all the work that goes on, but, you know, building those state affiliates and also building at the national level is, is top priority. And it's really, you know, we, we've really seen a growth since 2020, um, uh, a membership growth like never before. So we're excited about that, that process for us. Now, do you find that that membership growth is um, kind of an offshoot of this great resignation that folks are kind of maybe getting back to their roots, they are realizing that I can use technology, I can live wherever I want, so I don't have to deal with some of the stuff that isn't appealing to me about an urban or suburb, and I can go back kind of to my roots and to my home and live the lifestyle I'd like and, you know, have these opportunities that maybe this local community won't be able to give me, but I can still access kind of the, the world. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point. I, I think, you know, if you look at positives coming out of COVID, I think people wanted information and, and we were able to provide information and updates and really keep them connected to what's going on in D.C., but also at their state level through our state affiliates. I think that really helped us out in, in the sense of uh, membership growth and that that access to information uh, and updates. Um, and we served on several task force and teams from 20 from March 2020 and still today. And I think that's been a positive for our membership base as well. And then also doing a hybrid conference last year, doing an in-person in and online was a big growth for us. And it really helped uh, kind of make the connections even deeper and stronger with our our members in, in all the states. So um, any advice for other leaders of associations out there that are maybe have a membership that is spread out and disparate? Um, and how you can bring them together. What are the, some of the kind of do's and don'ts that you found uh, leading your organization that maybe they can learn from? I think it's good to have a board that's really supportive and really has kind of a, a visionary stance 
experience on how we're moved forward and bringing folks together. I was lucky to inherit a, a well-run machine uh, from Dr. John Hill, who retired. So that helped. But also, I think I think going with the 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 mainstream flow of what your membership base is looking for and what they want from you and staying in our lane. We don't try to get too much out of the lane. We try to stay involved and be, be a part of what we're doing. So now um, is there, can you share some of your vision of how you would like uh, your tenure as a uh, executive director to be like, what are some of the accomplishment that you're shooting for the vision you have of this association? I mean, I'd like to have a state affiliate in every state. So we'd cover all 50. That would be one I'd like to leave with the next person coming in. I also would like to, you know, uh, really grow our footprint outside our border. So more of an international uh, uh, membership as well. So grow our 50 state affiliates, but also look at international because we know rural small communities are everywhere uh, and really grow that connection and space. Now, is there anything you would like to leave for the lay person who isn't aware, maybe they aren't uh, familiar with their rural part of their state where they live and that some things that you'd like to share for them so they have a deeper understanding and maybe more empathy of what you're going through and, and understand the importance of serving this community as well? I, th- I think don't just assume um, that parts of your state rule, don't assume they are certain ways, meaning politically or socially or whatever, actually go visit, spend time, go find interesting things around those areas, go visit, um, go check it out. Uh, Be curious and don't be judgmental, be curious and find out what's going on. Yeah, that's a great lesson for everybody. I think uh, in this day and time, is there anything uh, that um, the folks in these rural communities need more than other things? Like I know, I would imagine that there are shortages of teachers. I would imagine that there are shortages of certain materials. Is there anything that we as just listeners that lay people could be doing to help uh, the, our, our community in the rural, the rural communities? Yeah, I think understanding that the, the rural areas, rural communities of our country are really uh, are really the backbone of a lot of things that happen in our country. And if, they, if they're surviving and, and excelling, that's good for our country. And to understand there is a divide. We, also, we obviously know there's larger cities and they do have a lot more population and things going on. But, but really understand that, you know, challenges are there. And even the smallest challenge that you think in that, that an educator in an urban area would think is, you know, that's not a big deal. It's a big deal in a lot of rural, rural communities. I mean, teacher shortage is, is happening everywhere, but it's a greater impact in rural communities simply because, you know, we're battling, you know, distance sometimes, but we're also battling pay differences that are major in that. Uh, and it's going to, you know, we're, we're trying everything we can to recruit and get folks to come teach in those rural schools and communities. We just, you know, we, we need help. And uh, if you're in an urban area and you want to try something different, please come out our way. We'd love to have you in the rural areas. Now, um, how about the, you talked briefly about how important technology has been to help through COVID. Is that one of those things that maybe a, a person in an urban or suburban area takes for granted that they have Wi-Fi, that they have internet, that maybe the whole country isn't benefiting from that level of internet connectivity and that maybe there should be more of an investment in the rural communities in this regard? Yeah, I think I think we, we all have Internet issues, but we do have uh, definitely high quality connectivity is not in all areas of our country, obviously. So, uh, you know, the more that schools go back and schools are in session, the schools are pretty well adapted. It's the communities and that, and that can be affordability, but it also could be just the right of our access to that. And we don't we don't have a, the, the greatest solution in all of our communities. And some of it won't be a fixed hardwire solution. Some of it has to be, you know, a remote uh, signal from above, so to speak. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And uh, we just need the opportunity to allow that to happen in all of our communities. It should be, you know, it should be like utilities, uh, it should be like power and water. There should be an opportunity for all to have those services. Now, are you seeing an opportunity for business to partner with education uh, in these communities as well that maybe isn't uh, being developed as quickly as you would like? 
Yeah, I think the the private business or the workforce industry in partnerships with uh, rural schools is it's getting better. And I think it's always there's always room for us to to strengthen that bond between the two. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes the K-12 environment and even the higher environment, we don't make it easy to partner with sometimes. We have to do a better job of working together to partner and to find out how we can better serve the regional workforce businesses, especially local businesses and how we can be a better uh, uh, player in our community, so to speak. Yeah, I would think there's a tremendous opportunity there to be creative and to work together, especially with these um, shortages that a lot of folks are having with employees, that if you're able to partner with an educational institution in your community and kind of grow your own employees and train them while they're learning and then they have a job after, that becomes a win-win for everybody. Yeah, that's a major deal. You know, partner with the higher ed institute is is vital for our rural schools and communities, and that can be done locally, but also regionally is a big part of that as well. So, uh, Doctor Pratt, it sounds like you have a lot of a lot on your plate. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're working hard, and uh, you know, you know, feel free to reach out if you have questions or ways to help or w- want to inquire about our association. Happy to answer questions. Well, if somebody wants to learn more, connect with you. What's the website? Uh, NREA.net. Uh, NREA.net. Dr. Alan Pratt, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Uh, you're doing important work and we appreciate you. Hey, thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We'll see you all next time on Association Leadership Radio. 